Good morning, everyone. My name is Maya Luria with TMC for Seniors, and I am so excited that today we're going to talk about a brand new topic that we've never discussed over at TMC for Seniors before. We're going to be talking about Genealogy 101. I am thrilled to have Leslie Carney here with me today. Leslie is a professional genealogist and a speaker with uh, specializing in Southwestern in the southwestern United States, Arizona, New Mexico, uh, Texas, and the Native American, Indian, and Sonora, Mexico. Her experience is in researching various uh, repositories, archives, and documenting family history. And she's a speaker who enjoys educating others on the understanding of social history, genealogical issues, and promoting the interest of, in genealogy. Welcome, Leslie. How are you today? I'm doing fine, thank you. Great. So you have an online audience along with a very large in-person audience this morning um, because, like I said, we haven't done this topic before. So when you're watching, if you have any questions that come up, please put them in the chat and then I'll ask Leslie once we're finished um, with her presentation and then we'll turn it on over to your in-person audience. So I'm going to go ahead and pull your PowerPoint up for you and you should be good to start. All right. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. I'm glad you all came to uh, listen to this presentation. Uh, Genealogy 101 is this is going to be a very quick, short version because there is a lot packed into genealogy. I'm going to just start from the basics and then start hitting on a few subjects. So your questions may not have anything to do with what I brought up, but that is perfectly fine because, like I said, this is a very broad topic. Okay. Genealogy 101. Many of us get started in genealogy for different reasons. Uh, you want to learn about your family history. Uh, you want to know where your family came from. There were stories you heard. You want to know if they were true. Or sometimes even for medical reasons. You want to know, you know, what did your grandmother die of? Did you have the same disease? Or you heard, you know, you have this, this um, disease and then someone says, oh, your great grandmother had that. So for different reasons, people get into it. I do want to warn you, it's very addictive once you get started into it, start playing around with stuff I'm going to be showing you. Very addictive. Okay. Today, we're going to cover on where you're supposed to start or where you should start. We're going to talk about documentation, um, what you need to document and how to document it how to organize everything that you find. So if you've been doing it for a year, you're not gonna say, oh, where is this? And then didn't realize you searched that or found that a long time ago. You're gonna stay, if you stay organized, that's one of my strongest point I can stress. If you stay organized, it'd be a lot easier. I learned the hard way years ago. No one taught me how to organize or anything. And then when I'm researching and later on, I find out, oh, I already had that information. I didn't know it all this time. So being organized is very important. Uh, we're going to also talk about what forms you should be using or keeping or documenting with. And that'll make your job a lot easier when you're doing research or you're going anywhere or you're talking to your relatives about questions. And what questions you need to be answered or asked. Because you may have a document, don't realize you should be looking into this question to find more answers to help you along the way. And then we're also going to talk about how to analyze your documents, what you, what you have in front of you, how to get all the information you possibly can. You always start with what you know. Pretty much it's what with yourself. You always start with yourself. Now, I'll give you an example. My dad and my uncle, the brothers, they all thought, one of them thought their name was this. Till they applied for a passport. They had to show their birth certificate, you know. People, like, we don't need it, you know, you don't travel. Because you, you, you know, the older generation didn't really need it. But now when he you gotta get passports, he my dad got it, found out his name was not his name that he's been going with all these years. He had to go legally change it before he could collect his social security because his name wasn't what was his birth certificate. His brother, my uncle. When he did the same thing for a passport, he found out his birthday was not his birthday. 
My, his mom lied about his birthday to make herself look younger. So he celebrated his birthday on the wrong date. So now my uncle has two birthdays he likes to celebrate. So even though you think you know about yourself, get your birth certificate. You verify it. That's what I just recommend. Um, like I said, but you start with what you know, but you make sure you document it also because it may not be true and that may throw you in the wrong path. Okay, now there are many ways you can document your genealogy. And genealogy could just be getting, whether you just want to get names and dates, or you want to learn more about the social life, the history of that, of your ancestor, or any individual you're researching. There are several ways you can document. You can purchase some software. Okay, you can purchase Roots Magic. Uh, that's a very friendly, easy project to use. There is Legacy Family Tree. If you purchase Legacy Family Tree, um, these are all the things you just, when you go online to purchase them, you know, you just download it so you can start the minute you hit start. Legacy also have webinars that you can watch. And I believe this is all in your um, syllabus, you know, the um, links to all this. Legacy, if you go on there, sign up. It's, it's free, just sign up for the webinars. When they put on a webinar, it is free <clears throat> for so many days, and their subjects range widely. It is free for so many days. If you want a syllabus, that's when you have to sign up as a member. It's Legacy is not that much to sign up for. It's under $100. I don't know if it's like $49 or $79. But, of course, right now, if you keep an eye out, there's specials going on, you know, for Halloween, Thanksgiving, Black Friday, Christmas. <laughs> So you can get it as cheap as I think it's forty nine dollars a year. Yes. So if you want to learn more, and you can go in there right now and see, and they'll show you. You know, this is this is a um, webinar. We talk about this, and if you decide you want to see, if it's not free, you want to purchase it. You know, you can do that. But you can actually see before you purchase what you're getting. Family Tree Maker is another um, one that is a product of Ancestry.com. That is another one that you can do. Here's it is a one that's been out for a while. It's not commonly known, but it's also another software. Now, this is a software where you go in there instead of using the forms that like I handed out to you, it's built into this program. So you can just type it in there. You don't have to, if you don't like paper. I'm one of the ones that like paper. <laughs> I'm still a little old fashioned. But if you uh, don't want paper, you can use this. You could also print out the forms. So the ones that I gave you, you can go in the system here, type in that information, and then print it out. So instead of you writing it, it's already typed on your form that you print out. So these are some of the databases that you can have. My Heritage is a place where you can go search for records. It's kind of like Ancestry. You can go search for records. You could also, on this one, if you go to My Heritage and input your family tree and everything. The other one that's very, very commonly known is Family Search. You can go into Family Search. This one is free. Out of everything I'm showing you, this is the one that is free. You can do it from home. All you're going to have to do is when you log on, is you know fill in your name, fill in your um, email address. Um, it will ask you for probably a phone number. Because if you forget your password, the two options are Send it, send your password to your to your phone, you know, your cell phone, or send it to your email where you got to click on to change your password. That's how they make sure it's you using it. No one's changing your information. And again, on this one, you could input your your information, you know, like for your family tree. This is me. This is my mom. And the coolest thing that happened with this one just recently is if you have that information in there, you can print your own family tree chart, which I'll show you a little later. I learned this. I just came back from Salt Lake and I learned this one and it's it was it saved me a lot of money that's doing this this way now. But this is one place you're going to search for free. And you can do it from home. The other place that everyone knows is Ancestry. Ancestry is a paid site. You can do the same thing as Family Search. There are a few things different between this one and Family Search. Um, on where the records are or how they show their records to you. Ancestry gets a lot of the information from Family Search. So if you don't find the image in Ancestry, it'll be in Family Search or vice versa. 
If you go to family search and it doesn't have it, that means Ancestry got to that record first to digitize it. So that's whoever has that image is the one who got to it first to digitize it. And of course, family search has been around a lot longer than Ancestry. Ancestry, you can get at any public library in Pima County. If you go to an, any archive, um, state or national, they also have Ancestry free of charge, where if they have computers set up, you can use them. But like I said, you can get it uh, at Ancestry at any public library. You don't have to pay for it if you don't want to pay for it. This is some of the forms you're going to be needing. This is a five generation pedigree chart or ancestry chart. They've been called different names. I did give you a blank one in your packet. And there is a, a link that I gave you that you can go on the uh, resource page there that you can go on. And there, some of these are form filled. So when you download it, you can fill in the information, save it to your computer or print it out. So you don't have to keep re re inputting things and you can go back and correct things if you put something in wrong. What I normally do when I fill these out, I don't fill out anything with dates unless I have documentation for it. If I'm not sure, like they were born a certain year, I put about ABT with the year, meaning I need to verify it. Or I put a question mark next to it. Or sometimes I will highlight it yellow. I need to find out if this is true. My mom told me this person was born on this date. Okay, I put it down. It gives me a starting point of where to go look. Then I know I've got to go find it. When I find the document, I either take off that question mark or unhighlight it to know that I found the document for that. This is kind of like your little map for your research. The other form is a research um, journal or a research log. This I highly recommend you keep. On this one here, you're going to keep pretty much um, information on the date that you searched, where you searched, the repository, whether it was online, Ancestry.com or Family Search, or you know you went to the to the state archives in person, or you went to the vital records office in the town. You're going to put down where you went to go search. Um, if there was a call number or anything, because next year you come back, you want to know where did you find that? Oh, I found it on, you know, on online, where online, you know, or you went to the public library and they had a book about your family, you put down public library. Okay. What was the call number on the book? I want to know, you know, you're sharing your information with me and now I know, okay, I'll go there and get it myself. Okay. So make sure you put that down. Um, what you were researching, if you're online, I always put down my search terms. You know, like I put down, you know, I want to know where the closest restaurant is. And all the restaurants popped up and I picked the one. How did I get to that point? So I always put down my search terms that I use. So I know I get back to that same spot also because the internet does change. It doesn't stay the same. Um, what I found, didn't find anything. Make sure you put that down. Let it, you know, you got to remember that, you. oh, I did search there on this date. A year later, you can come back because things change. It may be there a year later. So this way, you know, at this point in time, you didn't find anything, but later on, you did. Uh, the family group record. This is on the individual family. So like for me, I would put down my name and my husband's name and then all my kids' names. This is on the individual family. My kids, my kids will have their own sheet. Each kid will have their own sheet. So everybody will have their own sheet because the group record is more itemized than the regular pedigree. The pedigree is just the main branch. This one, you're narrowing it down. Um, for a research journal or a log, you've probably seen it on TV, you know, when people go around, they have these little books. They just write in the books, they're little notebooks. You can do that too if you want to do that. A spiral book, if you want to keep a spiral book, that is perfectly fine. Just as long as you keep track of everything. This is a family chart. Now, you can get this one. Remember I told you on Family Search? You can print this out on Family Search, this family chart. And you could, it would fill it in. So if you put it in, go in Family Search and type in, this is my mom, this is my dad and parents. When you go print it, it will be printed on this chart automatically for you color coded. We'll get to the color coding shortly. 
So you can print this from home. Very nice and decorative. You can even do this and hand it out at Christmas time to your kids. Uh, the chart could be anywhere from five generations, six generations, nine. I've seen it up to 16 generations. Now, of course, the family search won't do a 16, but you can order them 16. And if you get a program, one of those databases that you buy it yourself, there's a place where you could say print and take it to a print shop and they can print those huge, huge posters for you. There's also another chart, a family medical history chart. The links to this one, if you want to learn more, is in your handout. Uh, family medical history is, you will find from either word of mouth or from death certificates of what someone died of. So when you go to the doctor and the doctor always asks the history of your family, you know, who died of a stroke, who had diabetes, this is where you can record that stuff. If you start researching. So as you're researching, keep in the back of your mind what they died of. Because then you can always go back and do one of these if, later on if you want to, if you record what they died of. Not just, oh, I read they died this and then don't remember. You already have everything going. And this will say if someone has it, has a disease and they're still alive or if they're dead. Um, you could also mark it on this one. People, a lot of people are starting to do their medical history pedigree. So this is one way to do it. Your, your aunt could have died of it. It skips you but your kids may get it. So it may skip a generation. This is how you keep track if it skips a generation. You can do this if people have twins. So if you want to figure out who's going to have twins in the family, you know, you know, your daughter's not going to have it, but your daughter, daughter may have it. So you can do a lot with this medical history chart. DNA, definitely got to touch on DNA. Everyone, that's the crate. And these, this, these um, prices right now I'm showing you were as of last night. Okay. I made sure this was a current one so you can see. Again, watch Black Friday. Watch um, for Christmas. If you're doing one for males, Father's Day is the cheapest time. Mother Day, Mother's Day, that's the cheapest time to get one if you're going to do a female uh, DNA test. There are different, different types of tests you can do. Um, this is Ancestor. Uh, what is this one here? This one is... Family tree. Family tree is with family search. They're kind of related. So when you get this one, you can download it into uh, into your program. When you set up for your profile, you can download that information on there. There's one you can do for the females. One you can do for just the family. One you can do for where you came from, your heritage, and for the male side. For males, if you're following the males line, father, father, father side, that's the Y DNA, uh, paternal and the maternal. So if you're doing a female, it'd be mother, 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 mother. If you're doing the family, that's just broad. Anybody with that, with your DNA in it, it's very broad. So to narrow it down, of course, you want the Y DNA for your father or your mother. There is also ancestry DNA kits. There is also 23andMe DNA kits. There's also living DNA. I know Ancestry is the most popular one because they are the ones that uh, advertise a lot more, but there's several other DNA kits. There's my heritage DNA kit. The difference between these are the people that take them. Everybody in the world takes ancestry. So your percent, percentage of finding your relatives is like, like one in a million because there's a million people taking the test kit, just like a lottery. Um, living DNA, it could be one in a thousand, depending on how many people take the test kits, because that, that's who they're comparing you to, is other people that took that test that they have. That, that's, those are your chances of finding more relatives. The other thing on finding your relatives, it depends on where, you're, where you came from. Ancestry is from pretty much all over the world, so they're comparing you to those people. Family search is all over the world, so they're comparing you to that. Living DNA started in England, so if you're from Europe, that might be the one you want to take, because in Europe, that's like ancestry. 
To them, living DNA is like ancestry DNA is to us. So if you're from Europe, you may well take living DNA to narrow down where your ancestors or relatives are that you're related to is over there. My heritage kit is from Israel. The owner of that produced my heritage um, database and the DNA kit, he is very, very helpful. So when you go on there, you have a question or on, on whether it's a database or this one, you have a question to answer. He responds to you right away. I mean, like within 24 hours. Right now, because of what's happening over there, he is a little delayed because they're all in bunkers right now over there. He's right there on the front. So, but my heritage is another good one. That one is mostly for that. If you have like Jewish ancestry or something, it's very, very good to have. But their databases, of course, are broad. Now, also, when you want to, like I said, we want to record things. You can record things on the computer with those databases that you purchased and downloaded. And that's what one of them would look like on an individual and information you put in, and you can save it. The other one is file folders. And you're going to want to colorize them or at least mark them. I, I prefer to colorize them. When I learned, I started doing it, kept me track of what was going on. Um, and I'll go into the next screen, I think, is the color code one. I have a lot of Alfreds in my family. Okay, which Alfred is that? Is that three generations ago or my Uncle Alfred? So if I had it color coded, I know, or is it my Alfred on my mom's side? You know, I have a color code. I know which, which branch of the line that I'm researching. Um, I keep file folders even though I have a computer database. I'm going to a library. I want to check a little bit more on a certain ancestor. I can take that whole file right there. What if I can't open my computer? Oh, I'm in the library. I've got my cord. I can't plug it in. It's dead. I got my hard copy. So that's what I, I keep. And if I have find like a birth certificate or, you know, my cousin gives me a picture, I can put it in the original in there and make copies or whatever, but that's where I would put all my documents. Then I would keep them in binders. You could also keep things in binders and cheap protectors. If you get something like a birth certificate, you want to make sure it takes care of. I color code the binders. And that way I know, okay, red is this family, yellow is this family. So I could also grab the binder if I don't want to do a folder and take the binder with me to a, a library. If you go to a library, a research library, you'll see people with binders out this thick with their family. So you can do skinny ones or thick ones, however you want. You can start thin, and then if you get a lot of information, move up. But those are different ways you could also um, file information. Now, for the color coding, and this website that, that's on the screen is should be in your handout also. When you color code, to color code things to keep the line straight, the father's side, the grandfather is blue, the grandmother would be green. On the mother's side, the grandfather would be red, and the grandmother on your mother's side is yellow. Now, of course, you can change this up. It's your filing system. It's what makes it easy for you to find what you're looking for. But in general, this is what the color code systems will look like if you do want to color code. So for like my father's father would be blue. This folder will be blue. The binder will be blue. If I have a folder and I just get a blue dot next to his name so that, you know, instead of having a colored folder, there's just blue dots on everything. So then I know he's blue. If I go in my computer system and you have your file folders, I can color code those file folders. So anything that's blue, I know it pertains to my dad's side. Anything that's red, I know it pertains to my mother's side. And then I can break it down more. Some of the basic rules for when you want to record any information, when you go on a database, it does it automatically when you type it in. You type in the date, it will automatically correct it. Uh, the basic rules if you're doing it manually, the dates, you go by the day, the month, and then the year. You always put the four digits for the year, never the two. You can put down 2023. If you just put down 23, was it 1923? 1823? Okay, it may make you think a while, especially if you just pull out for that one person. Now, wait a second, same name. Is that my grandmother or my grandmother's grandmother's name? So you always, the year, you always spell out completely. The, year, the month, you could abbreviate if you want to. 
Names are always lower and uppercase letters. For instance, McHenry. If I did all capitalize, that just changed the, the meaning of Mac. Because I would think his name is MC Henry, not Mac Henry. So always just lower and uppercase when possible. Uh, the females, you always type in their maiden names. Okay, when you're doing any research, she's with the maiden name. Yes, she's with the record of her husband, but whenever you're referring to her, it's with her maiden name. Because she may have the same name as the, the, her husband's grandmother. So then you may get mixed up with the names. That's why she's always recorded with her maiden name. Whenever you're doing places, you always start from the smallest to the largest. So if you don't know the county, it's okay. You put down Tucson, Arizona. You don't have to put down Tucson, Pima. But you put down Tucson, Arizona, United States. That's how you normally should be recording anything that you're recording. In the databases, these would be automatic like this when you start typing in information. Now, now you want to research. You're looking for birthdays and places, marriage and places, and death. Those are the basic records that anybody ever wants to find. Granted, you're going to want to find a lot more. Um, but birth, marriage, and date is your main priority on everybody. And then go from there. If you find birth dates, you're going to go to vital records, church records, depending on, you know, when the time period was, because there might not have been vital records. They didn't keep birth certificates. Some of them didn't keep them until the 20s. Censuses. And everybody is going to search your census for anybody. That's one of the places to go to online. Town records will have them. Naturalization and citizenships records. Uh, marriage, again, vital records, church records, censuses and towns, and death dates. And you can see a pattern here for those three things. So if you find one record, hopefully you'll find the other information on that one record. And of course, other resources you can find would be in newspapers, military records, Bibles that you would find at home, um, property records, uh, court records. You can find all this information there. There's primary source and secondary source. The primary source is the first main thing when it happened, the first person. Secondary source is hearsay. Something like in the newspaper. The report is getting information from somebody else, from somebody else, from somebody else. That's secondary. So if you find the death in the newspaper, you're going to want to find the death certificate or you're going to want to go to the cemetery because the cemetery keeps records. You know, they have to keep records of when they died, when they buried them. Those are more primary sources. So if you find something in the newspaper, find something else because it could be wrong. Just like I said, my dad, you know, said he was, you know, had a different name. Newspaper record his name, but the newspaper recorded by what someone told him, not realizing his name wasn't that in the first place. So that's why you got to go to, the, to find the original source. Remember, who, what, when, where, why, and don't forget how. Whenever you're doing any research at any time for anything, answer these questions. And you'll have everything you need to do to find later or to pass on. Okay, this is a research log filled out. And this one is on Family Search. So you can always go, when you go to Family Search or Ancestry or any of those databases, always take a tutorial. It will walk you through on how to find it, things in their database, how to use their database. Uh, it'll give you a lot of examples of how to do things. And this is an example that's on there on how to fill out a research log. You see how they put the date, um, the place where they were researching, who they were researching, um, what they found, the results, nil. They didn't find anything, but it was recorded. Or if they did find something. And they put down what they were looking for. So you could do one for a research log just as you're researching, or you can do one on every individual. It's how you feel you want to do it. As long as you record it, that's what's important. So we want to know a question. Where did Mary Cummings die? That's my question. That's what I want to find out. That's what I'm researching. 
So the first place I will go to would either be family search for free. I would go in under search on the top tab, on the very top, I would go to search. I would type in Mary Cummins. If I know more information, I would click on um, other options. If I knew like her birthday or anything else, I would type on that. But I know she was in Arizona. So I just typed in Mary Cummins, Arizona, because I know that's where she was at. Actually, I knew she was in Tombstone. Didn't know anything else about her, but I knew she was in Tombstone. Now, Mary Cummings, just to give you a little tip, is Big Nose Kate. Okay? Everyone knows Big Nose Kate. Okay? This is, I like using examples like this. So, but I know her. She was Mary Cummings. But I want to know where she died. So I go to Family Search. Under Search, type this in. It will give me a record. I have a lot of Mary Cummings. I didn't know Mary Cummings made a name, middle name, or anything. I would scroll down. Okay? So then I would come to this record. And then I see she's Mary Kay Cummings. Her obituary says there she was died November 5th, 1940. And her birth year is 1851. Now I know roughly when she was um, born. Just roughly, remember it hasn't been proven yet. So then I go ahead and click on that little icon to the right. Okay, that tells me there's documentation there. So I would click on that or actually click on her name the way the, this database works. I would click on that, and this is what will pop up. It will give me the her obituary, saying she died at 89. Uh, the place that she died was in Arizona. And on the left there, it says where they got the information from. And you can see the obituary. It gives a little cite to citation. So on your research log right there, it's giving you all your information to document where you found it, when you found it. On the right side, it says similar records. So on the right side, it tells me if I want to um, see here, what is it there, a ledger. She was in the Pioneer's home in Arizona, which is in Prescott. So if I want to see that, I can click on that. That's the Pioneer's home. If any of you don't know, that's like a, it's a mining retirement home is where the old miners used to go. And there's a ledger log that would say, you know, all her information when she was admitted, um, who put her, you know, who because you had to be sponsored. The governor most of the time said, yes, they can go live in the home. Um, it would say who, who let the sponsored her letter in. And of course, then I would contact them and get more information. They will have a file on there, the letters from the governor at that time, you know, who, who sponsored her or letters of her asking, can I be, come to the home? I've got no family. I need to put some place to go, you know, where she wanted to die. So that's the trove of records right there. Um, if I went to Ancestry, I go to Ancestry, do the same thing. I type in her name, the place, just like I did in Family Search. When I clicked on it, same thing. Information will pop up, and I'll just have to scroll down and see what I'm looking for. Sometimes you have to hit all of them. Yes, that's a person. No, that's not the person. Sometimes you have to do that. Here on Ancestry, you see the records give different names. Mrs. Mary Kay Cummings, Mary Kay, Michael, Horny. Um, she's a widow. She died. It gives the same information, the age, the year. This gives you where she was born, what, the exact date she died, where she died, who her father was, her mother. And if you go down, there's more information there. But Ancestry gives you more information. When I clicked on that, this is what popped up. So that tells me Ancestry was the first one to digitize these records. This, these records, and it, Ancestry will tell you that these records also came from uh, vital records in Arizona, which are now, these certain ones are housed at the National Archives here in Arizona, or the State Archives in Arizona. Um, they were the ones that digitized this. That's why Family Search did not have a picture of it. So whoever has a picture is the one who digitized it first. So if I want to actually see it, I will go to the state archives and say, hey, can I actually see it? And I can see it. Of course, you got to be dead for so long, or you got to prove you're a uh, relative if it's more recent than 100 years. So look at this death certificate. Some of this information is primary, meaning firsthand, the person knew exactly. They were there at the time. In other words, whoever did it for the death, they were there when she died. 
her birth, that could still probably be a little mixed up like my dad because the person I gave this information wasn't there when she was born, unless it was her mother giving this information. So, but it gives us a point where we can start. So for her death, this is primary. This is, I don't need to go check another record. I know this is a good record. But look at all the information you get from it. What are there? What is there? 23 lines? 23 lines of information that we can go do more research. It gives us her father. It gives us her mother's name. Where she died. I can go there and get, like I said, and get more information. It tells us what time she died. You want to see the original. A lot of times when in my research that I've seen, some of these could have um, a red pen or a pencil handwriting on it. Because some of these are form filled, some of these are handwritten, depending on how far back you go. If it's pencil or if it's red, when they digitize, it might not show up. Digitize is black and white, so it might not show up. I've been to records where I've seen I've seen the digitized, but then I went to go see it in person and saw, oh, this isn't on the digitized one because of the color. And that gave me more information when I, once I saw that. Now I know where else to go because of that red, whatever they wrote on it. This one here, you see the 94A, 94A. That's handwritten. What does that mean? Was it something that they did when they digitized it? What was it? I'll give you a little hint. Oh, I'll give you a hint later, later on. <laughs> anyway, so once I got that information on my family chart, I filled in what I found. Okay? I went in there and filled out what I found. Like I said, I fill this out as I find the documentation. So I filled in what I can know so I can go from here. And, of course, from here, I could also ask, you know, like, okay, I got the mother's name. I want more information on the mother. So then I can continue from there. This is where I get all my questions or something I want answered from this sheet. I also recorded on the family group sheet just for her, her husband's name. Now it gave me her husband's name, where she was buried, where her parents' name. So I fill this out too. As I'm going, I'm filling out these charts manually or on my database. Now, this is in your handout at 94A. Every, every death certificate I should say of modern age because, you know, 1800s didn't have this type of death certificate, of course. There is a letter, a number written on all of them. Tells you, it says what they died of on their death certificate. This goes into more details. Yeah, they died of a heart attack. Is it high blood pressure? You know, what, what type of heart attack? You know, did they die of, uh, the diabetic also cause the heart attack? You know, what happened? That 94 narrows it down to other than what they wrote on there. What was the cause of death, but what triggered the death or whatever. International classification of disease. This is in your handout. You just pick. Pretty much you're going to find out what year or close to what year it was that person died. Because they do add new things because COVID is on there now. Ten years ago, COVID would not have be, been on this chart. So as new diseases come up, they add, give them new numbers. So you can narrow down to more. So if you're doing your medical history, this will narrow it down drastically for you of exactly what they did. Consumption. We don't use that word no more. They changed it. So if your destiny that says consumption, what's that? You can go to this and it will tell you what it is. So you will pick the year. You click on the year. And this will take you here. So see, 94A, disease of the coronary arteries. That's what she died from. It narrows it down to what it is. So that's a good place to always go find out if you want to know more details. Remember, there was 23 lines. 23 lines you're going to be researching, not just taking for granted what it said. You're going to be researching, okay, where, where in Iowa, where Davenport, you know, you can narrow things down line by line. So it's not just birth, marriage, and date. You're going to be actually going in and doing more and more thorough research. Census. You're always going to check the census. This is one place where you can go search. Um, Ancestry and Family Search both have census records. So, of course, I would go when I'm in that program, I would go in and type in Mary Cummings. And you can see on the line there where it says um, for Ancestry, that's highlighted. And whenever you type in a person's name and you go to the, uh, the 
census page, it will always be highlighted for you. So you can narrow it down. You don't have to go line by line. It'll tell you this is the one you're looking for. Now, this information, you can see that it would give, depending on the year of the census, it will give a lot of information, name, birth, where they're born. It may say, you know, did they have a radio? Did they, were they served in the military? Depending on the census, each census years give different information. Like the current ones we have, you know, I think there's just five lines. Well, way back then, they wanted to know more, more information. Now, on this one here, if the, in the 40s, there should be a little mark, an X next to the name of who gave the information. So if you see an X next to the name, and I don't see, I don't see one on this one. Oh, because this is the, the Pioneer home. That's why. This is the Pioneer, the, uh, the home where she was at. Um, it would give, if you see it for the 40s, if you see an X next to it, a name, that's the person that gave the information on the census. That's the only year that you know. So if it's like, if this was a, she was at home, not in an institution, she was given the information of her kids and all that, then the X would be next to her name and she gave it. So yes, yeah, she knows when her daughter was born because she was there. If it was her husband and he's given the, the, birth, the birth year and the age of his wife and his kids, he, he doesn't know when the wife was born. She was just telling me, yeah, I was 21. You know, so it may watch who gave that information. So the 40s is a good, good census to go. But this gives you a lot of information. As if we come up to it, then we can see some more of the information. It will even say where she's at. See the Pioneer House on the left hand side. If it was a if she was at home, it would give the street address of where she lived. And the, at the actual address and the street name. If this was an individual not in an institution we would also check newspapers you can go to ancestry you can go to family search sometimes the libraries have them also and this gave me information about her so if i didn't go to family search but i had a newspaper article i got information here i can pull out and start researching family search <laughs> family search has the pioneer logbook. This is the logbook that she uh, that she filled out when she uh, entered. It's like a hotel, you know. She had to fill out her information. This is the logbook saying what she when she entered, who her parents were, her age, and they're right there. If I were to touch the site, I could also get a citation, and the citation there will tell me what to put down on my research log, so I can go back later and find it. Or go see the actual record. I've been up to this Pioneer home. They had these logs still. I actually saw the original log book. I know because my great grandfather was there too. He was buried two plots down from her because when they buried him, they buried him as they died. She died just before he did. She's literally two plots from my grandfather, great grandfather. And of course, there's more information, a lot more information as, as the log book. So look at that. If I went on and found the log book or went in person, I get a lot more information than I did. Another place you go search, you have a name, don't know where they're buried at or anything, just know in Arizona, I can go to um, find a grave. This is in your website, on your handout. I can click on find a grave under search. I can put down her name, put down Arizona. Of course, I'd have to go down, 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 down until I find it. Find a grave is a collateral database. You can go to a, a cemetery, take a picture of your family's headstones, upload it to this. So if I'm in Arizona, you upload it, I can find, I can find it. And if you put a picture there, I have a picture. I don't have to go there in person. That's how these pictures get on these websites. And find a grave. Someone did a little bio on her. They took a picture of her grave, and that's what they posted on here. The, the, the little bio they did. Now, when you get information from here, take it with a grain of salt. It might not be correct, but it will give you a place to start searching. It's one of those little tips of, hey, um, you can find it on there. But find a grave, you can find pictures of them, and it might even give you, you know, siblings' names or, or children's names or something. Sometimes they do put a little bit more on this one, depending who's inputting the information. And remember, anybody can do this, even you. 
You can also do a Google search if you're looking for information. Someone once told me in passing that they said that they heard their relative came over in a coffin ship. When they told me that, I didn't know where the person came from. I don't know anything about their background. I was curious. I went to Google. Google's your friend. Google will tell you anything. You're looking for anything. Where's the military records? Google it. We'll give you a list of where to go look for military records. Okay, so I Googled it, put in coffin ships, and this is what popped up. So then I clicked on that. This is Wikipedia. Wikipedia is your friend. It's like the dictionary, like the encyclopedias. And this tells me about the coffin ships. This is uh, ships they called when people were coming over from Ireland. Now, I don't know if this person was from Ireland or not. They may say, oh, no, no, that's not it. Keep in mind, I have some relatives that came from Italy. They could have come straight from Rome or whatever the, the port is and come straight to U.S. No. They came out of England. They went up. They went over the Swiss Alps. They came all the way up through England to the U.S. They could have come straight across. Why did they go through England? Be a lot of reasons. People were selling tickets, you know, to get on ships. Maybe he got it and said, okay, yeah, it's cheaper for me to go this way than go that way. Or, you know, maybe it was safer. Who knows? But that gives me the story about the coffin ships. So that gave me some research to do. Doesn't mean that they were from um, Ireland, but that's how they came across. So you can always Google. Google anything you want to research, Google. Um, Cindy's List is another one. You go on Cindy's list, and that's in your handout. That's the data um, uh, website where if you're looking for something, you just click on it. You're looking for military records. You click on M. It's has the alphabet on the top. You click on M, and it'll give you a list of where to find military records, websites, books. I mean, that will help you drastically. Cindy's list is a very, very good um, where to go find things. Of course, you can also YouTube it. Go to YouTube. There's a lot of video tutorials on there for any little subject. If you're um, you're German, you're, you're looking for some German um, records, go to YouTube. There'll be things of uh, how to read German script, how to you know find your German ancestor in you know in whatever city or state. I mean, there's so many YouTube videos out there for just for genealogy. So you can just search genealogy if you're learning genealogy and want to learn from more in depth than what I'm doing here. Um, go to Google it or YouTube it. Or, like I said, you can go to Legacy and check their webinars. Okay? So, what did we cover? We covered on where to start. You either start with yourself or start with what you know. We talked about how to organize everything and document everything so that way you know where you're at, where you're going, what questions to be answered. And how to, you know, pick a question and stick to it and find your answer. What I normally do is I have a question, I go research it, I'm going round and round, okay, it's four hours, I can't find anything. I have another one, I stop, go somewhere else. I come back to that one a month later, whatever, because who knows, like I said, internet, boom, the information's there now, it tells me where to go find it, so I can come back to it. I don't stick on it, stick on it until I find it, it'll drive me nuts. I find it, if I don't find an answer, I move on real quick, just keep my brain clear. And then how to analyze, how to record, how to pull out everything you can from that document that you found. So if you do all these steps, that's the beginning part of genealogy. Okay. Thank you. And then I'll take questions. So thank you so much, Leslie. So I have a couple of questions. One is, is there, um, if you've already maybe started in, this could have been years ago, but started like a family tree in Ancestry. Um, is there a way to then sort of export that over to the family search, which was the free site? Um, Ancestry is a paid site. They will not let you transfer it over. You've got to be careful. Some A lot of databases, the competition with each other, so they won't let you download and put it on their site. So the answer to that is they can do an S S V. I think it's an S V where they can download it into like computer language and then move it over. So yes, they can, 
It might not be the same format. It may come out a little different, but yes, they can. And with that question also in DNA, when you do your research for your DNA, when you get the test kits, sometimes when I get the information, I can upload it to another DNA company to get more. So like see family search only does a family a tree DNA only does this, but then this DNA site does a little bit more. I don't have to take a swab or a spit test again and I want to upload it. Some of them will let you do that to get more information out of that one result. So you've got to, you got to really read the, the print to see who's allowed to do that, who's not. So you don't take pay for taking five tests. You can just take one and upload it to different ones. That's so. great information. I Yeah, and I was looking at, um, you know, I know with Ancestry, since there is a cost to it, uh, in order to maybe like continue on if you if you've stopped paying, you know how you can continue to do that. That's why it was wonderful to hear about the family search. I had not heard about that one before. Yeah, yeah. If you use Ancestry, if you don't pay, you lose everything. So if you do DNA or anything that you put in Ancestry, you got to always be paying to keep that information. Otherwise, you don't get it. It's theirs. So yeah, watch 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 which one you do. I do okay. love that a lot <laughs> so you might have to start from scratch again or and then just sort of add those things in um to maybe keep keep up your search from the sounds of it um so there was a question about avoiding genealogy scams and it sounds sort of like what maybe not a scam but just that um with ancestry you are going to pay each time as compared to maybe some of the other sites right is there any other scams that we should be aware of um in family search if you put up your tree in family search so like you would go in and you would click on you look like we're looking for mary cummings they will give a family tree somebody went in there and did it saying this is her mother this is her father and all that you will see it you click on it you would see the pedigree already there you will see that chart somebody else did it okay we're saying she's my aunt we'll just say that i would say oh no that's wrong i can go in there and change it in family search Saying, no, that, that information is wrong. I can change it. That person can come back and change it again. Say, no, I'm right. We go back and forth and until we get a hold of the um, one of the, uh, the help people in family search and they kind of like a mediator getting, okay, which one's right? Can't touch it now because they proved it. Um, they could be changed. And ancestry can't be changed. I have my family. My sister could have hers. We both have different father's names. You're right, you're right, you're wrong, you're wrong, no. She has hers, I, so you'll see for my family, there could be five of us have different family trees. We're all different because that's what we put in. You can't change mine. So be careful with that. The scam for family search would be anybody can change it because it's a community-based kind of thing. Um, the only one that they can't change is if you get a database, you download it on your computer and you have your own. No one can change it but you. Great, okay. Um, are there any other, you know, when you start, the, the best way to maybe, like, the first questions you should really be asking to start your research? And I know it's overwhelming, I think, um, for a lot of people to sort of think about how they're going to start the whole project. Do they start with themselves and then sort of work backwards? or No, you always start with yourself okay. because you know where you're at. You can find where you're born and then go from there. If you start with like uh, your great grandmother, how do you know she was your great grandmother? How is she tied to you unless you have proof of the paperwork that you're tied to her? You don't know. It, they could, as far as I know, the person was adopted and that's not their mother, their grandmother. So you always start with yourself because then you know that's true. Great. Um, and is there anything, um, if somebody wanted to hire somebody to maybe research their family for them, um, how does that work? Well, there's different ways you can do it. Um, this is not in the web so on your handout, but you can go to, um, to a APG, Associate Professional Genealogist website. Or if you do Cindy's list, you know, and it says, you know, you want to hire someone, they have all these little links on all these places. Um, in APG, it would put down, you can, you're looking for a certain state, certain town, or a certain, like, Native American. You would type in your criteria and a bunch of names will come up. You can contact them, get their prices. Everybody is different. 
Uh, if you go to um, historical society, if you go to a library, check with the librarian there. Sometimes they have the local people there saying this is who will do research for you. Um, you can just Google professional genealogist, um, you know, Tucson, Arizona, and see all the names that pop up. There are genealogical societies, historical societies. You can get, get hold of names. If you're researching in uh, Boston, get a hold of a historical society there. Hey, do you have names? Or just pop in Boston Genealogical Society, see what names pop up. Some people do research for free, some people charge. So that's how you'll find somebody. Great, okay. Thank you. I This was great information and I think really valuable for everybody to sort of learn so that they can document their own family history um, and their own family tree. So I'm really, I'm so thrilled that you were able to be here with us today. I'm going to sign off with our online audience and turn it over to you for any questions in person. So thanks for being here today. Thank you. We appreciate you uh, coming in today to learn all about genealogy and uh, Genealogy 101. Um, we'll be back uh, next month. We have just wrapped up for October. Um, our calendar is on its way to your mailboxes. So please watch for that to show up and we look forward to seeing you in November. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to give us a call or if you need the handouts from today's presentation. Um, we did go ahead and email them to anyone who was registered, but if you were not registered and you're watching today and you still would like a copy, please let us know. You can always call us at 520-324-1960. Thanks and have a great day.